Okay, then I'm going to get back into, well, not back into, but I'm going to start talking a little bit about optics. So this is the problem of reflector or refractor design. Okay, there's a lot of different problem setups, um, but the basic problem setup is that we want to somehow control a beam of light, and we need to design a system of either lenses or mirrors uh, that will do what we want to this beam of light. Okay, when do we want to do this? Um, maybe we want to do uh, efficient illumination. You know, it might come down to we want street lighting that you know covers all the area that we need, but we don't want to have a ton of overlap because now we're wasting resources. Um, it could down, come down to headlight design, uh, where I think we've probably talked about this example before. You want your high beams to let you see in front of you, but hopefully not blind the oncoming traffic. Um, so there's certainly uh, illumination lighting companies that are interested in these techniques. And, and there's, there's research in this area and optical transport techniques in particular coming out of some of these uh, illumination and lighting companies. Um, laser technology, uh, I think optical data storage, uh, problems in astronomy where you're trying to design telescopes or antenna uh, can be phrased as these type of reflector and refractor design problems, these beam shaping problems, uh, radar. Uh, so, so there's, it's, it's the same problem that comes up but really, mathematically it's the same problem almost that comes up in a lot of different uh, areas. Uh, so let me just give you a little cartoon here. So we have some input beam <coughs> uh, and it has some input intensity. And there's different setups. Maybe it's a point source. Uh, maybe we have some sort of parallel beam. Um, so in this picture, maybe I have a parallel beam. Uh, and then I have some target that I want at the end of the day, which again, there's different things that I might want. Uh, I might want to be looking in the far field. I might want to have a particular image projected onto a screen somewhere. I might want to produce another parallel beam that just travels with the, uh, with the given target uh, distribution. So somewhere out here, I'm specifying what I want this to end up looking like. OK, so what do we need? We need to either have a, a mirror or a lens, or possibly more than one mirror or lens, uh, that will transform this. So somewhere along the way, we're going to design some kind of optical element that makes this happen. <coughs> so this here is going to be a lens, a mirror, or maybe, maybe more than one. OK, the forward problem is easy. So say I know my input intensity, and you hand me a lens or a mirror or something like that, and you say, this is the surface of it. This is what it looks like. Um, I can solve the forward problem. I can do ray tracing, for example, and figure out exactly what my output is going to end up looking like. Right? That, that part's easy. That's not the problem we want to solve, though. The problem we want to solve is this is my input. This is the target I'd like. What does this optical device in the middle have to look like in order to pull that off? And the easiest thing, the thing that's typically done in practice, is to say the forward problem is easy. So let's guess. Put something here. We do ray tracing and we see what we get. Does it look like we wanted? Mm, not really. OK. Um, so let's, let's tweak this a little bit. Try again. We do some ray tracing. OK, that's closer if it's not quite right. And iterate basically in a trial and error process. Trial and error, um, obviously not efficient. And it may not give you great results at the end of the day. So what you'd really like is a direct method that says, if you, you know, solve this system of equations or run this algorithm, this pops out and it will give you exactly what you want. 
<coughs> okay, so in this, I'm we're talking geometric optics. I'm talking where ray tracing makes sense. Okay, so there's, we're not worrying about diffraction here. Um, you, you can build that in a little bit later. Had some, some, some success there. Um, low frequencies, and where this makes sense. So I'm going to do uh, a little model problem and, and try to see how we can relate this to optimal transport. Again, there's lots of different setups that we might have. So this is going to be our, our model problem for today. Let's design a mirror. that transforms a parallel beam of light okay, with a given intensity okay, and we're going to bounce this off into some uh, target intensity in the far field. So we're going to transform this to a desired target intensity. I'll call I out in the far field. Okay, so let's see if I can try to draw this a little bit. So we've got, here's our input intensity. Okay, I'm going to have coordinates. So the input intensity, right, we're, we live in a three-dimensional world. This intensity is, is defined on some plane somewhere. So it's going to be defined in the, let's see, that's a right-hand coordinate system if I do this. I n is defined as a function of these x and y variables. Um, but now this, this thing is propagating in this direction. <clears throat> OK, now somewhere along the way, I'm going to have some kind of mirror. The mirror is some sort of surface in 3D. Uh, I'm going to assume that I can represent my surface this way. Of course, we don't know what u is. That's going to be the whole goal. If we can solve for u, we can figure out how to design this mirror. All right, so things reflect off of this mirror. And then we get some sort of pattern in the far field. So when I say we're in the far field, what we're really going to think of this output intensity as uh, a function of spherical coordinates. So we have some pattern that travels out radially. Okay, so this is my output intensity. And here, again, I'm thinking of this in as sort of a cross-section that lives on the sphere, part of the sphere. So I'm going to think of T living on the sphere, the unit sphere. <coughs> okay, so let's say if we happen to know the shape of the mirror, uh, we can do ray tracing, right? We could say, all right, light that originates at this point x comes up to the mirror. It bounces off, and then we can figure out what angle it bounces off to. And what angle it bounces off to is really this coordinate t in the sphere. So light originating from x okay, is going to be reflected in some direction. And I'm going to call that direction t of x. Okay, and t of x, again, is, it's a direction. So we're thinking of it as living on the unit sphere. Yes? The origin of the sphere before it enters the lens? What's that? The origin of the sphere before it enters the lens? 
the origin of the spherical coordinates is the lens at right. And, and because I'm thinking of this as being out in the far field, I, you can approximate this as being just basically one point. Okay, so let's do let's do some optics. Uh, so if I zoom in on my mirror a little bit, what do I have? Well, I have light coming in in this direction. Right, it's coming in vertically. I have <clears throat> the normal to my mirror. That obviously matters. OK, and then this gets reflected in some direction that we called t of x. <coughs> OK, so we can write down n. This surface we knew was given by u of x, y. So its gradient is going to tell us about the normal. So n unnormalized is going to be ux, ey, and minus 1. Standard first year calculus or second year calculus, whatever that is. OK, and we know how reflection works. So the law of reflection. tells us, and what do we expect? We're going to expect the angle between here and here, and here and here to be the same, right? Okay, so we can write this as z hat minus 2 z hat dot n hat n hat. Okay, so let's compute what this is. This guy is 0, 0, 1 minus 2 times right, uh, z hat dot n hat. Uh, so if I do z dot n, that was 0, 0, 1 dot this. Okay, so that's going to be just a plus 1. Uh, and then I got to normalize things. So I have an n hat and another n hat, so I've got to normalize this twice. Uh, so let's do this ux squared plus uy squared plus 1. And this is going to be in the direction of n. Okay, so if I try to combine this all together, bring it all over a common denominator, what do I have in the denominator? I have gradient squared plus 1. Uh, I have a 2ux, 2uy, uh, ux squared plus ui squared plus 1 minus 2. OK, so this should be my reflected angle. I um, can go back and actually double check. If we dot this uh, with n, this dot n is going to be uh, minus this dot n. So the angles are going to work out the same. OK, so if we knew the mirror, we know where this gets reflected to. Yes? All right, now what do I need to do? I need to use the, build in the fact that I want this kind of pattern to happen in the far field. So what do I really have? I have some sort of conservation of energy condition. 
that if I, if I zoom in on some little area here and I add up the intensity in there and get the total amount of energy, and then I look to find out where all this got reflected to, the total amount of energy in there should be the same. We haven't gained or lost anything. And we can compute exactly how much energy we want in that little set because we know we want this kind of target output. This is, this is exactly the kind of conservation of mass condition that we've written down before. Okay, so conservation of energy. What does this say? So this says for all E, okay, so for all sets E, let's start in this little source plane. If I add up my input, it should be equal to what I get in my output now where I look at the set where this got mounted to. Okay, now I guess I'm integrating over the sphere. Okay, so I have a rule for my ray mapping. This is the rule for my ray mapping. Uh, and it's going to be subject to this condition. Uh, the, sphere, the sphere complicates things a little bit. So uh, if you're like me and, and you're a little bit lazy when it comes to having to work on manifolds and things like that, and you'd rather just work on the plane, um, you might say, let's try to turn this into an equivalent problem on the plane. Okay, so since the sphere complicates things, let's try to find an equivalent problem uh, where instead of this living on the sphere, it would live on the plane. Uh, do you know a strategy for relating the sphere back to the plane? What's that? OK, the stereographic projection. That's exactly what I'm going for here. OK, so let's try to do a stereographic projection of some kind. So, so abstractly, first of all, this is what I'm trying to do. I have uh, this, uh, this uh, output shape that lives in uh, the sphere. Okay, and we're going to try to come up with some rule that takes this onto some kind of set on the plane, whatever it is. Okay, I'm going to call these coordinates C and eta. <coughs> and indeed, the rule that's going to do this for me is a stereographic projection. So let's do a stereographic projection from, say, the North Pole. Okay, so what's happening here? Here's my sphere. Uh, I'm going to have some plane going through the center of it. I'm projecting from the North Pole. Okay, and now I take this point and I want to decide where it should end up on the plane. Right, so I say, well, let's draw a line from the North Pole through this point and wait to see where it intersects this plane. And that's where it's going to end up. So the coordinates of this are going to be C, eta, and, and zero in this 3D representation. Uh, and that will let me find a home for everything except for the North Pole itself. Uh, so 
hopefully I have a target out here that doesn't want anything heading to the North Pole. If I do, I should have projected from somewhere other than the North Pole. OK, so what's going to happen? This goes to the plane, so what's my? It's my transformation. It's given by this. And this will take me out into my C and eta coordinates. And we could also go the other way. Okay, so the inverse transformation is going to be 1 over c squared plus eta squared plus 1, 2 c, 2 eta, and c squared plus eta squared minus 1. <coughs> OK, so what am I doing? Now I need to find an effective ray mapping. So I'm going from here to here, and then from here into here. I need to know where I end up. Okay, so let's find the, I guess, effective ray mapping. Okay, onto this plane. Okay, so I started here in my x and y coordinates. We went via t of x onto this sphere. And now we're going to go via PFT uh, back onto some kind of plane. <coughs> okay, and my effective mapping, I'm going to call T tilde, which is given by P of T of X. OK, so I need to take t of x. t of x is written over there, and I need to plug it in here. Uh, so let's see. What's my effective denominator? 1 minus t3 is going to be 1 minus grad u squared minus 1 over grad u squared plus 1. OK, so if I put this all over a common denominator, what do I get? Grad u squared plus 1. That goes away. 2 over grad u squared plus 1 is my effective denominator. OK, and then I need to put t1 over this and t2 over this. So t1 over 1 minus t3 is going to be, what's my t1? My t1 is 2ux over grad u squared plus 1 times the reciprocal of this, which is ux. <coughs> uh, and the other component is going to be uy. So indeed, t tilde of x is nothing but ux and uy, or in other words, the gradient of u. OK, so I have an effective ray mapping that says light gets reflected okay, effectively to here. And 
What else do I know about the ray mapping? Energy is conserved, yeah. So I need to take that, this condition and, and try to put it in terms of my new coordinates. Nice, so conservation of energy. All right, I know that I want to put it in terms of my new coordinates. All right, I want to get in terms of C and data. Okay, so to get this, something from here in terms of C and eta, I'm going to let T equal the inverse of my stereographic projection. Right, the inverse gets me back to my T coordinates. So change of variables. Okay, T equals P inverse of my C and eta coordinates. Okay, and then obviously there's a scaling term here when I do my change of variables. So the scaling term is going to look like dt by dc crossed with dt by d eta. That's how much areas change. I'm not going to do the calculation. I assume that you know how to do this. This works out to 4 over the norm of c squared plus 1. Okay, so what do I get? My input intensity is equal to my output intensity in these coordinates. Okay, now scaled by this factor, 4 over c squared plus 1. Okay, and I was integrating over T of E, but now I need to integrate instead over T tilde of E. Now this should look a little bit familiar. We've seen problems like this, things like this before. We say I have conservation of energy or conservation of mass condition, right? The, the amount of energy in this set is equal to the amount of energy in this set. That's just conservation of energy. And then we had another condition. We also know what this ray mapping looks like, right? We know that this ray mapping has the structure of a gradient. Right, so let's put that in there. Let's say, let's let this ray mapping be a gradient. So let's let, let's do another change of variables, C equal the gradient of U. Which is also uh, T tilde of X. Okay, so what do I get? My input intensity, if I integrate, is equal to my output at P inverse of the gradient of U. Okay, times 4 over 
radiant of u squared plus 1. I need the Jacobian of my mapping. We've seen this before. It's the Hessian of U, the determinant of the Hessian of U. Okay, and T tilde of E is going to correspond to integrating over E again. And this is true regardless of what little set E I've picked. So you've seen this before, right? The, the terms, okay, the terms have a slightly different form, slightly different labels, but we've seen this before. And we know that all of a sudden we can read off an equation that our mirror surface has to satisfy. So we're going to conclude that the mirror surface should satisfy okay if I rearrange things a little bit the determinant of the Hessian of u is going to be equal to I in of x uh, divided by 4 over rad u squared plus 1 i out of p inverse of grad u. So what is this? This is the Mojan pair equation, right? It's actually exactly the way we've usually seen it. It's a function of x. This is like our f that we'd usually call. All of this depends on the gradient of u. So all of this would take the role of our usual target density g. Um, so what is this bias? Well, first of all, we know a lot about this equation, right? So I mean, a priori, I set up this problem that I want to come up with a mirror that goes from here to here. And a priori, I mean, you might even ask, is, is, does this probably even have a solution, right? You know, it's not, it's not probably obvious that I can find a mirror that will produce any target distribution that I want. Maybe I need more than one mirror. Maybe I need to do some other voodoo. I don't know. But all of a sudden, I can look at this and say, well, if there is a mirror, it's going to satisfy this equation. And I know things about this equation. I know what it takes to make this equation well posed. And in particular, I know that if I restrict my attention to building convex mirrors, this has a solution. Um, so here we've got a strategy not just for building the mirror, but actually for proving that uh, such a mirror exists. So what did we gain? Now we know that there exists a convex mirror. but actually reshapes the beam the way we want. <coughs> so we get well-posedness of the problem. Uh, we get a strategy for actually constructing the mirror. If, if assuming that we know how to solve the motion pair equation, okay, that's I'm not a small assumption, but, but we have a direct strategy for constructing the mirror. Which it turns out actually does seem to work in practice. And um, we, we together with a, an optics lab in, in Arizona, uh, we actually ran some motion pair code and said, can we build a, a, a mirror? Or an, it was actually a lens, I guess. A system of lenses to transform this beam into a triangular shape. 
uh, not doing the trial and error approach, but doing the Mosher and Pair direct approach. Uh, and it actually worked. And they constructed the lens. They solved the Mosher and Pair equation. And it said, it popped out, this is what your lenses should look like. And they built them, and it worked. You passed a laser beam through it, and you got a triangle. Uh, so this is actually a practical method for, for doing this. Um, if you're not in the geometric optics regime, this assumes you can do ray tracing. Um, but what you can get is a good initial guess that you can plug into some sort of end game strategy that actually makes use of the full waveform. Uh, so I've had some success with that too, is to say these algorithms want a good initial guess. OK, we can give them a good initial guess. Uh, and then do something else to correct it and actually account for diffraction and things like this. Uh, so, so it's a nice application. Uh, it has the advantage of being two-dimensional, which 2D problems are a lot easier to solve numerically. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a legit two-dimensional application. Any <coughs> questions there so far? So I said there's lots of different problem setups. Um, I picked this particular problem setup carefully in that uh, at the end of the day, I knew the ray mapping was going to come out to be a gradient. And when it popped out to be a gradient, then all of a sudden, we're kind of in business to say this looks like a motion pair equation. But again, there's lots of problem setups. Um, sometimes you might need more than one mirror sometimes, or lenses or different things. Um, so what happened? We got lucky here. Somehow, with this precise problem set up, we got lucky. It looked like a gradient. We said, oh, great, this is a motion pair equation. We're not always going to get lucky. But it turns out there actually are some deeper connections between these type of mirror uh, and lens design problems and optimal transportation, even in the case where, where I can't say anything as simple as that. So I want to do another exercise, or at least start another exercise uh, for another problem set up which, again, it's a specific setup, but it, the, the working is going to illustrate more general principles this time. This was, this was special. I was doing it with the goal of being simple. This time, we're going to do it with the goal of saying, how does this kind of generalize? What could we do for harder setups? <coughs> I'm still going to pick the simplest version I can just to keep the details under control. Uh, but. But the things I'm going to do here, here generalize to a lot of different setups. OK, so this is uh, the simplest setting I could think of that kind of illustrates mostly everything that's going on. So again, I have a parallel beam in. And I want a parallel beam coming out. Uh, and I'm going to do this via mirrors again. You can do it via lenses, and then you just have this image of refraction that uh, pops up throughout. So let's do this via mirrors. <coughs> OK, so let me try to draw what I want to do here. OK, so again, I have some, some input. Draw my coordinates. Okay, this is propagating in this direction. Uh, and I'm going to let x equal my source plane. And then somewhere along the way, I want to try to bounce this thing into another parallel beam. Okay, it has some output intensity. And this time it's parallel. Okay, and I'm going to let y equal the target plane. Which, by the way, it doesn't really matter where I stick this target plane. This, this thing is just propagating and it's keeping the same shape as it propagates because we've got a parallel beam. So I could, put, I could put my target here, or I could put it up here, and the beam would look the same. 
OK, now somewhere in between, I need to stick a mirror or maybe more than one mirror that's going to pull this off. <coughs> uh, let me draw some coordinates here, too. I'll call this y1 and y2. And this direction is going to be my w direction. And this direction here is going to be my z direction. <coughs> and I'm going to say that I've put this target plane up here at this height, which again, it doesn't matter where I put this. Now, there's two things that I'm really trying to control here. Right? In, the, in the first example, I was trying to control one thing. I had a target uh, intensity output that I wanted to control. Uh, that's still the case. I have a target intensity output. So when I land on this plane, Z equals L, this is the target intensity that I want to see. But I want more than that. I want it to still be the case that if I go up here, some other plane, I see the same target intensity. I want this parallel. So there's really two things that I'm trying to control, the intensity and the phase of this thing. Uh, so with two things I'm trying to control, we might hypothesize that maybe I need more than one mirror. One mirror gave me the intensity last time, and we got a Wepple's problem. Maybe I need more. So I'm going to hypothesize that I need two mirrors. Uh, and again, hopefully, we can find out at the end of the day that we write down a problem for them that actually has a solution. So my hypothesis is I need two mirrors. So I have one mirror here things bounce off of, and then maybe another mirror here that things bounce off of. Okay, so this is my hypothesis. We need two reflectors. Okay, so let's. I'll uh, define them like this. I'm going to call the first one R1. And I need, again, I'm going to have a function that defines it. So I'm going to represent this as z equals u of x1, x2, where x1 and x2 belong to this plane. Okay, so this guy here is R1. And this guy here is R2. <coughs> okay, R2, I'm going to represent from this plane. So I care what W is doing. So this I'm going to call uh, W equals V of Y1, Y2. Okay, there's more going on. Uh, presumably, I need more than just a single Mojan pair equation to pop out here, because even if I got a Mojan pair equation for this, I still need something that tells me what this is. So there's obviously more than just one simple equation that's going to pop out. Um, but we're going to see that this connects nicely to optimal transport. OK, so again, I want a ray mapping. So we see some kind of ray mapping that I'll call M, which goes from X to Y. <coughs> okay, uh, it's as before. 
a light that starts here. Some point x goes boing, 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 and lands at m of x. Okay, and we expect conservation of energy again. Okay, so conservation of energy going to do what we always expect it to do. The determinant of the Jacobian of this ray mapping times I out is equal to I in. Or just to bring in all our optimal transport terminology that we have because we know we're trying to do something with that. Another way of writing this is that the push forward of, of IN through the map M is equal to I out. So let's, again, try to figure out what's going on. Uh, let's give some labels to things. I'm probably going to get as far as setting up labels to things and writing down kind of the basic physical principles and then, and then stop because I don't think we can finish this today. Uh, but what happens? A ray leaves the point x. OK, it's propagating in the z direction. OK, it hits this mirror and gets bounced off in some direction that I'll call t. So it's reflected in the t direction off of R1. OK, then it comes over to this reflector R2, and it hits it at some point. <coughs> OK, um, so this, this hits reflector 1 at the point x1, x2 in some vertical coordinate. This is going to hit this at the location y1 and y2 in some vertical coordinate. Okay, so it hits R2 at location Y in this plane with some vertical component and is reflected in what direction? Negative w, yeah, or positive z, exactly. So we're specifying what direction we want this end reflection to be. So it's reflected in the either z hat or minus w hat direction. All right, let's see if we can draw some of this. So I'm just going to try to draw my two reflectors here. Here's R1. OK, so what's happening here? We've got, uh, this is my z hat direction. This is going to be the normal to this reflector. There's two reflectors, so two normals to worry about. 
and were reflected in the t direction. And this height is what we're calling u of x. Right? The height of the reflector is given by u. And u is our typical normal. OK, so it bounces off here. It comes down to my next reflector, r2 down here. Okay, so it comes, comes in here. Still traveling in the t hat direction. All right, I've got a normal that I'll call NV. And we bounce back up in the z hat direction. OK, if I have uh, my y1 and y2 plane down here, then this projecting onto this plane, this is y equals m of x. Right, m of x is my ray mapping. So a point that starts out at the point x, x is here, comes up here, bounces to here, comes at my target plane. And we said the point where it hits my target plane is m of x. So now I'm just taking that and then I'm just projecting it down here and labeling it down here. OK, so this was r1. This was r2. <coughs> Okay, my target, if my target plane was up here, then this height is going to be V of Y. And this total height from my source plane to my target plane I called L. OK, uh, so we're traveling up here to u. We travel some distance here. And then we have to travel this distance v. Uh, so I'm going to label this in-between distance as d of x. Okay, so let's let d of x uh, be the distance the ray travels between r1 and r2. OK, now I can write down the optical path lengths from that this ray travels starting here and ending on my target plane. It goes up this distance till it hits the reflector. That's the distance u. It travels this distance, d. And then it comes back up from this reflector to my target plane, which I labeled v. So the total optical path length is, we'll call it capital L, and it was, again, the distance to my first reflector, this distance between reflectors, and then the distance to my second reflector, where there's a particular relationship between x and y, right? y is equal to m of x.
OK, again, I, I did this setup for this problem. But you could do the same kind of setup for, for uh, different problems, right? You could do it where you just had a target plane and you don't care that the beam is parallel, so there's only one mirror. Or you could do it for lenses, and now the index of refraction plays in, right? All of this I could have done for any problem. This is just the simplest one to write down. The key sort of physical principle here is that it didn't really matter that I started with this point x. I could have started with a different point x. Because we're going parallel to parallel, the optical path length is always going to be the same. <coughs> and this is related to like Fermat's principle that you know, the light wants to travel the shortest distance it can. So this is going to be the key physical principle, principle of uh, equal optical path. And this says that the total optical path length between any two wavefronts is going to be the same for all rays. So we're going parallel to parallel here. So whichever point x I pick on this source plane, I'm starting on the same wave front. And again, you know, we're going parallel to parallel here. So wherever I end up here, on my target plane, they're all landing on the same wave front. And that means we're actually all traveling the same distance. So this is going to be the key physical principle that we need. Okay, so because we're parallel in, parallel out, L of x is going to be constant. OK, and this is. physics result. <coughs> so this is going to be the key principle that we work from. Um, so again, the process is basically the same. You do the ray tracing. You look at the optical path length, regardless of your setup. And you write down the physics. What does the physics say has to be true about the optical path length? And then we reason from here. I didn't, I'm going to stop a little early today because I don't have time to finish this example. Uh, and I don't want to stop in a too weird place. Um, so maybe next class, uh, if I can, I'll try to come in a little early and replace this diagram because we're going to probably still want it. Uh, and then we're going to keep going from there and try to see what in the world does this have to do with optimal transport? Where am I going to get these surfaces out of here at the end of the day? <coughs>